when we heard about the project, we all got really excited. I know it's something that I've wanted to do for a long time, really getting into bringing, math, bringing the real world into math and then also having the students read and write. I was a journalism major in college, so I'm really invested in reading and writing. I always tell the students that's how you make a lot of money with math is be able to communicate it to other people. So, I, um, so we decided on global warming as our big kind of thing that's going to span across biology and English and uh, math. Being able to link all of them through this one text was really exciting. We settled on the global warming fairly quickly. I loved it because I saw some very clear numbers. In the first paragraph, actually, it talks about how if the ice caps decay at 12% per year, they're going to disappear by the year 2030. And mathematically, that's impossible because if, if it decays by a percentage, then it's never going to completely go away. So that was kind of the main, one of the main things I was hoping my students were going to see in solving the exponential equation and seeing that they couldn't solve it equal to zero and wait, will they ever disappear? And so that was really exciting for me. And obviously, I mean, there's the whole big current debate on global warming. I knew that would be huge for English. And that was another one of our goals, to pick a topic that it wasn't like a one shot and then they're done. Like, I mean, global warming, it's gonna be in probably every political race from here for the next hundred years. And I mean, it's a very important topic to think about, so. We found a video of just on YouTube kind of highlighting global warming, highlighting polar ice melt. And I showed about the first minute or two of it to my class as an introduction. And there's this great image of the Statue of Liberty underwater. And as soon as the students saw that, they were very engaged. And it was like, oh my god, when's this going to happen? It's like, well, we're going to find out when it's going to happen. We're going to figure out the points. We're going to figure out the pattern. We're going to write the equation. We're going to figure out which equation is right. And that was one of the big highlights for me. The biggest impact for me and my students was that it really made the math real. I could have given them tables, I could have even given them real world tables out of the textbook and said this is how you write an exponential function from this, but actually seeing it and seeing the graph, seeing where the points came from, realizing that wow the ice is melting, the Statue of Liberty is going to be underwater, they were so much more engaged in just learning the mathematical process. There is a time when we love the higher level thinking, we love the discovery, but you do have to learn certain mathematical algorithms and processes. They're not always the most exciting, but putting it in this context really does make it a lot more exciting. Um, and it makes them read and they see, oh wow, we can read and the math applies to it. Like, because I know this math, I know I can tell when the ice is going to melt. First of all, they read. A lot of times just getting them to read is a struggle, but they read. And they read the mathematical graphs, they read the, the text features, the graph that was in there, that even without asking them, they were reading the captions to see, oh wow, what is each, what, what does one mean on the graph? Or what do the years represent? Or one of them even asked me, he's like, well, why are you starting, it looks like the graph starts in 1979, why are you starting in 1980? And I did that just to, so we had a square number to start at, but it, they're realizing this on their own from, from an article. So just the fact they're able to pull all that stuff out and then go solve for when they think the ice caps going to disappear was great. A lot of times you think, oh, well, in math, I can't read from an article, or how am I ever going to find something, or I have too much to do but these do fit into our standards. They do have time and the kids will learn it better. Um, the second thing I would say is that it's not that hard to find the stuff. There's Google, there's OER, there's tons of places to find connections to the real world for almost any of our standards. There are some people and even some teachers that think that this kind of work is too hard for our students. Um, and I just want to tell them it's not. If you scaffold it, show them how to read it, show them different annotation strategies, different text analysis strategies. The only work that they really can't do is the work you don't give them.
I don't see any state that this doesn't, I mean any country, honestly, that this doesn't apply to just the global warming aspect. But even the mathematical and the science and the English aspects, they might, the actual um, content might not be exactly the same everywhere, but every, in every Algebra 2, Math 3, pre-calculus, whatever level it's at, students need to solve exponential equations and understand that they don't equal zero. In every English class, probably from first grade up through college, you need to be able to cite evidence from text and argue. In every biology class, or at some level of science, you're gonna to need to discuss the environmental impacts humans have. Um, so, yes, and I think that holding students to this high level in every school, in every city, in every county, in every state is extremely important. 